I usually would like to begin a conference um, by putting in um, what I like to call, um, let's call them brain teeth. The idea is um, just to whip up your interest in some some passage of scripture probably that you are already familiar with but maybe to give some interesting dimension to it and today i'd like to begin by looking at this particular text from matthew chapter 15 reading from verses 32 to 39 it's a passage you're very feedback 15, 32 through 39. Um, I'm getting a bit of feedback from, from the microphone. All right. Now, the, the passage is one that I have to try not to tell. One that you all know so much about is the feeling of the 4,000. And um, uh, one of the questions that arises when we are looking at passages of scripture like this is, oh, what really is the meaning of this? We know that Jesus has, um, a few chapters before, has fed 5,000 people with uh, five loaves of bread and two fish. And then we are in chapter 15, and then we find another story in which Jesus is feeding 4,000. And the meaning is not immediately obvious uh, what, what this really is about. And uh, I usually like to begin my conferences by just, uh, you know, looking at it briefly, just to uh, arouse some interest in this particular passage or other passages. So what is this feeling of the 4,000 about? Uh, why, why tell it the same story twice? basically, he said 5,000, feeling 4,000. What, what is it? In actual fact, uh, to be able to get into the heart and the core of this particular account of the feeling of the 4,000, you, you really just need to go a couple of verses, you know, um, before. And you will notice in verse 29, this is Matthew 15, 29, you will notice that, um, in fact, already from 21, Jesus was in Canaanite territory, so he was not in Israel. He was outside, you know, among, let's say, Gentiles. In fact, uh, probably around the coast of Syrophoenicia, Tyre, Sidon, Lebanese, modern-day Lebanese territory, that's where he was. And in fact, he had dealt with a Canaanite woman who had her problem, so on. Then, in 29, it says, in Jesus went on from there and passed along the Sea of Galilee and he went up on the mountain and sat down there and great crowds came to him bringing with them the lame, the maimed, the blind, the mute and many others. So this is the passage that precedes the feeling of the 4,000. Now, the passage of the feeling of the 4,000, again, we see certain interesting details. For instance, um, over here, it says, you know, Jesus said, how many loaves have you? And they said, seven. Um, and fish. And then he gave thanks and broke them and so on. And they all ate and were satisfied 
and they took up seven baskets full of broken pieces left over. So again, what is particular about this passage? You remember that in the other one, there were 12 baskets full. This time, not 12, but there are seven baskets full. And there were seven that were there. What is the issue here? Now, you remember that in the sabbatical year, in Leviticus chapter 25, after you have harvested your crops, in sabbatical year, you're not supposed to harvest the leftover. The leftover in the sabbatical year is left for the underprivileged in society. So the gleanings that fall from the crops, you remember also the book of Ruth when uh, Boaz was, you know, uh, harvesting Ruth, a widow, a foreigner has the right to come after her and pick up the gleanings. So the gleanings are left for the poor. Now, before coming to this passage, Jesus, Mark, Matthew is giving us the context. Jesus is dealing here with the maid, the blind, the sick, and so on. These are the poor society. And the feeding of the 4,000 is about the feeding of the remnants, the leftovers. And that's why it's seven loaves and seven baskets left over. And feeding of the 5,000, 12 baskets, that's for Israel. And after Israel has been fed, even the Canaanite woman must have her share. The poor must have their share. The weak must have their share. And that is what the passage is seeking to address. So, um, it does have a very, very interesting, you know, reading. And that, uh, just to let you into this a little, is what is really at stake in this passage. Not just Israel. We should have an eye for, for those who are left behind. In fact, one of the other talks that we shall be having, we shall be dealing with things like this. And not to forget the less privileged. We will come back to this. But the project for this afternoon is, um, as you see, I will lead her to the desert and speak upon her heart. Hosea chapter 2, verse 14. And I'm talking about the biblical forms of the priestly vocation. Now, this morning, I was arguing that um, at Fontes, Let's go back to the sources. And I begin to argue that one of the sources is our history, where we've come from as diocese. That we need to interrogate questions like, how are we here as priests of Accra? And that we need to interrogate the vision of people like Monsignor Brezia and what he thought. What was his motivation for coming to the West Coast? And I was arguing that this man said, he needed to form local priests for a local church. That's why we're here today. Now, having put that aside, I mentioned also that the second, you know, it's like we're breathing with two lungs. And the second lung, which we're breathing, is a question of going to Fontes, the scripture, go dig in to see who we are and Apart from the question of what role are we going to play, we need to understand first and foremost, in essence, who we are. Then we can talk about what we should do. So who we are, we need to go back into the scripture. Now, 
I have chosen this particular passage from Hosea chapter 2 verse 14. It looks very benign, but really it's not. And I have highlighted the word desert in red for a reason. Now, you will find that on the pages of the scripture, the question of the desert is one that the scripture keeps going back to. We're always talking about the desert. Always talking about the desert. Yeah, Hosea, I will lead them back to the desert. You know that the whole of the Exodus event practically is in the desert. At the beginning of the Gospels, John the Baptist is crying out in the desert. Jesus came to, to, to fast and pray in the desert. Why this insistence on the desert. Now, a desert in the biblical you know, idea, important to note, is the place where Israel's fundamental institutions were given birth to. Now, why is that? We know that the desert is the place, for instance, where the law was given. Sinai was in the desert, not in the promised land. We know that the cult, the temple, you know, the sanctuary has its origin in the desert. It's a fundamental institution. It's not like the kingship. The monarchy was given when Israel was already in the promised land. What is the meaning? The meaning is that if the kingship, if the monarchy, for instance, it was in the promised land or came to be instituted in the promised land, if you take away the land from Israel, they lose the monarchy. That's why when they go into exile, they don't have a king anymore. But things which were given them when they were in diaspora, when they were in the desert, are things that you cannot take away from Israel. You take them into exile, but the law will remain. You take them into exile, but the priesthood survives. In fact, as you might know, Israel even today, today, is still waiting for the Messiah to come. And one of the things that the Messiah is supposed to do when he comes, according to them, is to rebuild the temple of Israel. Now the only problem is that the temple has to be rebuilt on the site of the ancient temple. And currently, the al aqsa Mosque is sitting on that site. So you have to blow that mosque before you can rebuild the temple. And that will cause the Third World War. But apart from that, Israel even today is interested in keeping an unbroken line of priests who can trace their lineage to the Levites. And you can imagine for how long Israel has not been in Israel. In several centuries. And yet for them, the priesthood is something that is not lost. If you like it, you turn up. Anytime you hear an Israeli with a name, the surname Kohen or Kohen. Kohen simply means priest. And what he's telling you is that I belong to that family. And they are only waiting for the Messiah to come and they will reconstitute the priesthood of Israel. But these are institutions which for the Jew are eternal. They don't go away. Now, therefore, um, to retrace or understand what the priesthood is in Israel, you want to go back into the scripture 
and you want to go into those parts of scripture which for the Jew are fundamental and from the image that I'm just showing you you can see that for the Jew the Torah or the Pentateuch is the core and most of the Pentateuch is about the story of Israel in the desert not in the promised land the fundamental Jewish institutions if you want to find the fundamental ones you find them there and those are the ones that define whatever else you find in fact it's very interesting that if you do a good study of the Pentateuch the likelihood is that you can interpret any text in the Bible any text because every other text somehow or other is based on the Pentateuch and from this concentric arrangement that is the way they do think the Torah is at the heart and the core and therefore if you really want to understand what the priesthood is, according to the mind of Israel retrace your steps at Fontes at Fontes go back to the desert go back to the Pentateuch to those accounts which fundamentally define for you who are Christians and you find it and what is even more interesting as far as I'm concerned is you just look at the the layout the architecture of the five books of Moses okay Genesis Shemo, uh, sorry Genesis the receipt in the beginning Exodus Shemot, names, Leviticus, Vaitra, he called, Numbers, the Medvah, in the desert, Deuteronomy, Devari, these are the words, the Hebrew names. Look at the architecture and look at what is in the center. Look at it here. At the center of the Pentateuch is the priestly book. The priestly book. Before it is the name of a book, Exodus, a book, Shemot, according to the Hebrew, names, a book of vocation. After it, is the location of the vocation in the desert look at that the priestly book in the middle the vocational book before it the location in the desert and so there's really no digging into the sources of who we are and going at Fontes to the source, the scripture, and not just the scripture, but in the understanding of the Jewish sense, get to the Pentateuch, get to the heart of it, then you'll understand. Now, one of the things that I'm interested in doing, which really, really fascinates me, is to show that in actual fact, if you look at the Pentateuch, and in fact, the whole Bible, is something that I find interesting. Interesting. You will find the fingerprints of the priests all over. In fact, as far as I'm concerned, the Bible is a priestly book. The book written by priests. And even, even though they might not make it so obvious, just you just need to take a second look and you see their fingerprints all over the place i think i'm having a small difficulty fingerprints everywhere now let me begin yes let's go to the book of genesis okay you remember the story of the creation uh, genesis chapter 
uh, one and then eventually in chapter chapter two uh, this is one and three. I hope I don't have too much interference from the man so chapter one and following uh, chapter verse one and following says that then the heavens and earth were finished and all the hosts of them and on the seventh God finished his work which he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done so God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it because on it God rested from all his work which he had done in creation so and this is a very normal benign statement it doesn't seem that there is much to it God rested on the Sabbath day, you know that it's clear. And yet, you said that even though God rested on the Sabbath day, God did two things. He blessed Barak. He sanctified the rest. Now, who blesses in Israel? To Numbers chapter 6. Aaron, thus you shall bless the eyes of Israel. The Lord bless you and keep you. Let the face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Priest. Who does the best? Sanctify things. Priest. What is he saying? Now all of you cannot work on the Sabbath day. I, the priest, I can work. I alone. <laughs> That's why you work on the Sabbath day. That's why there is rest for everybody except you. It's a priest book. Only the priest has the power not to rest on the Sabbath. You just put it there. Slip it in. So oh, God rest. God rested, but He blessed. He sanctified. Therefore, it's possible to do those things on the Sabbath. It's a priest book. Remember Abraham. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 and following. Now let's go take a look at it. Always better to read it. So, Abraham says, Go from your country, your kindred, go from your country, your kindred, and your fathers, up to the land I will show you. And I'll make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and your name and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse him who curses you. And all the families of the earth shall, shall bless themselves by your name. How many times do we hear the word bless? Bless, 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 bless. And you begin, immediately you begin to say, okay, well, who is this Abraham man? You know, that everybody is, is blessing in his name and he's being blessed and so on and so forth. And, and this is just at the beginning of the Abraham story. Slips it in there very gently. So, you are not surprised later on. In Genesis chapter 17, when Abraham has some visitors, before we realize, they say Abraham is making some cakes for them. And that Abraham took fine flour, a Hebrew word soleat, to make the cakes for them. Go and check the books of Leviticus and so on. That's the flour that priests used to make the unleavened bread. He's a priest. Uh, Genesis chapter 21, 22, you're reading the story of Isaac 
and Abraham is sacrificing his son. Okay, who is he? He's a priest. Only priests sacrifice. So it, it, it appears as if on the face of the scripture, all these characters, you know, are giving a priestly feel. Like I'm saying, like these books of the Pentateuch are priestly books. And they'll always find a way of pushing in the priestly theme. And telling you something, you know, about, about the priest. Or shall we look at someone else like Moses? Remember Moses? Um, let's look at Moses. Remember Moses with a burning bush? Um, you know, he goes, says, and Moses was keeping the flock of his father in law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. Immediately at this point, he begins to say, mm. uh, Moses has to go to the seminary. Before he launches out, it's very clear his formator is a priest. Maybe not necessarily an Israelite priest, but yet a priest. Remember Melchizedek and Abraham? A priest. And not only that, you remember that later on down the line, we shall see Jethro again coming to visit Moses. I think this is in Exodus chapter 18, giving Moses advice on how to handle, you know, the, the so many people that were coming to him, so on and so forth. Priestly concern is there. And even more. When it says that Moses approached a burning bush and he looked and the, the, the bush was burning that it was not consumed. The Hebrew word is said for a fire, you know, and so on is used. And you wonder. So what, what, is this, what is this question of the burning bush? What's it about? What, at the call of Moses, there's a question of the burning bush. That is not extinguished. That keeps burning. Go and check it out from Numbers. It is only in the sanctuary that you have the perpetual fire. That is never extinguished. So even in the call of Moses, that whole of the burning bush, the fire that does not go out, is a priestly image. A priestly image. Why? Because eventually Moses will be the one to consecrate the people of Israel. Last time we were reading from Exodus chapter 24. The ratification of the covenant. What does he do? He slaughters the bulls, pours half of the blood on the altar, half on the people. You know, Moses is eventually cut out as a priest. In fact, Moses is the one who is going to then give all the instructions how to do the Passover, sacrifice the lamb, and so on and so forth. So it looks like on every page, on every page of this beautiful book, you find the priests are talking. In Exodus chapter 19, the whole of Israel, whole of the people of God, are going to be explicitly in Exodus chapter 19, reading from and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation the people set apart so again the theme of who these people are 
the fact that they are priests everywhere everywhere and all this must necessarily happen in the desert yes. there is definitely a reason now we haven't even finished we can go on to people like even outside the pentateuch begin to talk about people like jeremiah one of he's a prophet we all know that he's a prophet and what does jeremiah say in jeremiah chapter 20 is he not the one who's talking about a fire that is burning in my bones oh, and it's as if it cannot be extinguished go and check from jeremiah chapter 1 jeremiah son of hilkiah one of the priests of Anatol is the priest. Now in Jeremiah is the priest. It seems as if these priests have their fingerprints everywhere. You want to come even as far as the New Testament. And you begin to see more examples of that of who these people are and so you find in luke's gospel chapter 3 verses 1 and 2 the uh, story of john the baptist and those passages that i so much enjoy the 15th year of the reign of tiberius caesar pontius pilate being governor of judea and herod being tetrarch of galilee and so on and so forth goes on to say in verse 2 in the high priesthood of Annas and Therefore, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. Very interesting, very interesting story. We have Annas and Caiaphas, we know where they are. They are in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem. And Luke seems to be saying that, but look, if you want to look, then please go and check the one who is in the desert. I don't forget that Zechariah is a priest. John the Baptist is a priest. If you're looking for the authentic priest, you find him in Jerusalem. Go to his source. He must be from the desert. And when John the Baptist, remember, is the one who will make the ultimate sacrifice of shedding his blood and even look I, I, in fact it's interesting because later on i'll be showing you other stories that luke does and luke luke in particular seems to be very very sensitive to the question of the priesthood In fact, it's not surprising when I saw this in Luke's gospel, it's not surprising at all. Luke has this argument, basically, that the priesthood of Jerusalem is no use. Go back to the sources. Go back to the essence. We shall see many more examples as the days pass by. And is another example, if you like, of the authentic priest. The priest is the one whose vocation can be traced to the desert. He's the one who has the eternal priesthood. The one that does not fall apart even though there are problems. The one that goes into exile and comes back intact. With a Now, look at somebody like Paul. He's the one farthest away from the imagery of priesthood. In fact, the argument, you know, whether Paul deals with the priesthood at all is, is very interesting. Um, some people even argue that the letter to the Hebrews was written because in the whole of Paul's writings, it doesn't really deal with the question of priesthood. And therefore, probably, that is why the letters the Hebrews finds its way into the New Testament canon to deal with that absence of the priestly theme. Because like I'm saying, the priestly theme is so important that you can hardly do away with it. 
And even Paul, in arguing in the letter to the Galatians about his authenticity, if you like, as an apostle, is going to the priestly seed. Going to argue that, look, I did not even go to Jerusalem, I went to the desert. But true, Paul doesn't need to do that. But a certain feel, a certain authenticity of an association with the original, with the ad context, with where it begins, even Paul seems to be interested in this. Remember the beginning of Jesus' own ministry. Um, according to almost all the accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, where's the first place that he goes? The desert. And over there, um, he is going to be tempted by Satan in the desert. Now, there's a very interesting difference between the temptations in Matthew's Gospel and the temptations in Luke's Gospel. In Matthew's Gospel, the first temptation is about the bread. The second one is that Jesus is taken to the temple. And the third one, he's on a high mountain. Luke changes the order. In Luke, the first one is about the food. The second one is on the mountain. The third one is on the pinnacle of the temple. Again, the Lucan emphasis. It's in the desert, but the temptation, the biggest temptation, according to Luke, is a question of sacrifice. The question of who is the authentic priest. Is authentic peace. For Luke, that is the major key in the temptation story. Who is the authentic peace? Jesus himself um, seems to go back again, back to the source, back to the desert to begin his old ministry. So why, coming back to question, why is the desert so important? Why should the priestly vocation be traced necessarily to the desert? Now I began to mention that first and foremost, um, the desert because uh, over there, the people are not yet in the promised land um, they are in the desert and that is a place that is, if you like, more permanent in a certain sense. But in what sense? You see, when Israel came out of Egypt, it did something. It meant that they are no longer under the control of Pharaoh. They are people. Two, they are not yet in the promised land. And therefore, they are not under the instructions of any king. But the desert is the place of freedom. It's a place of freedom. It's the place from which you make a free decision about how to live your life. You are not under any direct bondage whatsoever. And I think that this is a fundamental part of who we are as priests. The fact that the priesthood arises from a certain liberty. Choose today whom you will serve. I will serve the Lord.
and that none of us in this room was under any duress whatsoever to choose this vocation. We chose it from a position of complete freedom. And that is fundamental to what the priesthood is. The priesthood in Israel was instituted at a time when Israel was free. Neither under Pharaoh nor under the king. But free. We are not in the house of bondage or anything. We are free. And the second thing is that the desert, of course, uh, if you look at the, the Decalogue, a, any of the versions of the Decalogue, Exodus chapter 20, Deuteronomy chapter 5, they all begin in this way. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. They all begin that way. This is a law for free people. Before he gives you the law, make sure that you are free. And the desert is also the place of fundamental choices. And in the desert, the people of Israel had a choice. You can either decide to go to Egypt to return there or to go to the promised land. The reason why you are free is so that you can make a choice. But that choice is going to be permanent. In the DNA of the priesthood is that you are making fundamental choices. You can go to Egypt if you like. You can go to the promised land if you like, but you are free. Each one of us, at some point, before we came this way, had to make that fundamental choice about how we wanted to live our lives. In fact, no one forced us. We need to go back to that point. We chose freely. But the desert is also a place of death. And you remember that the people who came out of the promise of Egypt into the prom into the desert, in fact that whole generation would perish in the desert. It's only a new generation that will eventually enter the promised land. And there's a way in which the priesthood has written in itself the fact that we must necessarily die. The, sacrifice, the priest who offers a sacrifice is not in any way distant or foreign to what he's offering. That's interesting. There's one passage that I like to use to illustrate that. That passage is in Exodus chapter 12. And if you read from Exodus chapter 12, the very interesting account of how the Passover should be celebrated. And then it says, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this man shall be for you the beginning, of, the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month they shall take every man a lamb according to their father's house, a lamb for a household. And if the lamb, if the household is too small for a lamb, 
then a man shall and his neighbor next to his house shall take according to the number of persons and so on and so forth then in verse 5 in verse 6 it says you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month now what is the meaning it says that you shall choose the lamb on the 10th day and you shall keep the lamb until the 14th day i'd like to end on so it means that the lamb is going to be, to be in your possession for how many days? Three, four days. Now why? And it's probable that some people explain that probably you're, going to, you're not even going to feed the lamb. You're going to starve it so that there is no feces in its entrails. Because you know, you don't want to, you're going to sacrifice something, it's going to be pure. And you don't want it in any way to be contaminated or polluted or whatever you want to call it. So that's a possible reason why you keep the lamb for three days. But it's possible that there's another reason for that. Remember the story of uh, David and Bathsheba when he killed uh, Uriah. And when the prophet came to him, to tell him you know about his sin the prophet began by telling him about a man who had an ewe lamb and it's interesting in that story that says that this man that he had this ewe lamb and that he kept it as it were in his bosom so that the love almost became like one his children. Now you see, if you have even chicken in your home, I'm sure those of us who grew up had chicken running around our home. There was a particular chicken that you, you fed and so forth. And it came to Christmas time and you had to keep chicken. And it became traumatic. you have become so used to that particular fowl or that particular goat that seeing it die at least you know you, you were a bit sad by the time the priest or the head of the family had kept this particular lamb with him for three days when he was going to slaughter it on the 14th day he was involved in the sacrifice The sacrifice no longer was an impersonal affair. He felt it on his skin. And you see, this was a necessary evil of being a priest. Life of sacrifice is not impersonal. That is why you suffer. If it's written in your DNA, your whole life is like the burning bush. Burning but not consumed. And you will continue to burn. Because it is a necessary part of the priesthood. And this was never lost on, on the people of Israel. Up to today, I always think and I smile about the fact that the Jews refer to the Shoah, you know, the extermination of the Jews under Nazi rule, that they call it the Holocaust. That's the name they give to it. It 
it is a sacrifice of a necessarily priestly people. The whole extermination of the Jews under Nazi Germany is spoken about in priestly terms. If you are suffering, my brother, you are a priest. The necessary part of what we must go through. There's no priesthood without sharing intimately in the sacrifice. You're not holding that bread impersonally in your hand every morning and saying, This is my body. You'll be in that. You'll be in it. Every time you break it, you'll be broken. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. For us in the beginning, now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.